Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the HIV AIDS Activism and the Politics of Pandemic. This evening features Professor of History and Legal Studies at California State Monterey Bay, David A. Reichert. This event is part of our Community Reads 2021. To join this event using a telephone only, please dial any of the following numbers. I'll read two of them aloud. 1-888-788-0099 or 1-833-548-0282 and then slowly enter the webinar ID of 997-8859. Four five two six, and the passcode is two zero two one zero two zero seven. As an attendee, your microphone is muted for the entire presentation. We are not taking open mic comments. You do not need a microphone, camera, or a screen if you only want to listen to this meeting, as it is accessible by landline or mobile phone. We are taking questions. If you are joining by computer, you may use the Q and A feature to type your comments. On the Zoom control bar near the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A icon. In the lower left corner, you'll see audio settings, then the Q&A icon, and then leave in a red rectangle. If you're using a mobile device, the Q&A icon likely appears near the top right corner of your screen, so everything's in reverse. In the upper left corner, you'll see leave meeting in red letters, and then Q&A over in the upper right corner. Once the event begins, if you're joining by computer to see all the panelists, you may need to use the Zoom control bar and select gallery view. Depending on the size of your mobile device screen, you may need to scroll over to view whoever's speaking. And then finally, if you're accessing this event via Chromebook or the web browser only, you may not see all of the panelists at one time, only the panelists speaking. I'll now turn it over to Denise Ward to introduce our program. Denise? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Denise Ward. I'm a member of the Friends of the Abtos Library, and tonight we're really pleased to have David Reichard uh, here with us. Um, again, feel free to type in your comments and questions into the Q&A. And I just want to mention our next event uh, is a book discussion group on February 11th, and that will be run by Judy McNeely for the Abtos Library. It's open to the public. Anyone can, can join. And then uh, we have something unique coming up. It's a, a cut paper art workshop. And this is gonna be led by artist April Zilber of the Felton Library. And she's, uh, she's a Friends member of the Felton Library. And that's going to be on February 13th at four o'clock. So now let's welcome David Reichard. Thank you, Denise, uh, very much for the uh, nice introduction. And I'm so glad to be here today. I'm going to share a screen to get started. And I'll tell you, I, when I read the book, uh, I was very moved by this book. And I'm, when Denise and I started talking about this uh, presentation, I really resonated, what really resonated for me was sort of the back story, the history of activism under, underneath the story. So we're gonna focus a little bit on that today in the presentation and I hope you enjoy. Uh, if you have questions while we're going through, feel free to put them in the Q&A and if I see a burning question, they will be able to weave it into the discussion right away. But we'll uh, save some time uh, towards the end. So in the book, um, <clears throat> Fiona, the character Fiona in The Great Believers is recalling Chicago in the 1980s. And here she's thinking of um, Asher, one of the characters. Asher would speak up at ACT UP meetings with a voice like a politician from a black and white movie. He'd break into city council with his bloody handprint banner. He and his friend chained themselves to Governor Thompson's front fence one summer, got arrested for the millionth time. And for those of you who are not too familiar with this, uh, ACT UP was an organization called the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, founded in New York City in 1987. It was a direct action organization that was founded by people with AIDS and their allies. And in their focus, 
they were very much about uh, civil disobedience, confrontational politics, with a focus on trying to get better AIDS treatment research, public awareness around all of the issues, and eventually embracing concepts like universal health care or access to health care. <clears throat> they regularly challenged uh, officials, uh, politicians, health care providers, insurance companies, whoever would have an impact on AIDS care or research. And they were very known for their creative use of popular media and street art. And so when Asher here is referring to this bloody handprint banner, or when um, uh, uh, Mackay is re referring to this, uh, the image that came to my mind was something like this. This is a poster that was created in the 1980s um, that would be used at protests, act up, embraced this image. Uh, and here's a typical, it was a sticker, a poster, all kinds of things that appeared all over city streets. The government has blood on its hands, one AIDS death every half hour. And what's interesting to me about this particular image is that it had its origins, not in uh, sort of a national campaign around um, HIV or AIDS, but in a very local struggle uh, in New York City about access, uh, about a sit-in that uh, a emerging ACT UP did in uh, the Department of Health in New York City. And they began to use these sort of art images um, as a way to express the sort of anger that they were feeling around the issues um, that they were engaging. And um, what's interesting to me about this in the context of tonight's talk is sort of how these images got deployed around the ACT UP's work around um, New York and then eventually the United States. And what's important to me, I think, for us to, to really think about tonight is this idea that this was created out of, out of a very local struggle, something that was going on in New York City with a local health com commissioner here. They're targeting the mayor of New York, Ed Koch, um, with this posting is around the city of New York that eventually became an image that became popular around the country um, in protests that act up staged in different cities. While it started in New York, it emerged around the country in different uh, places, including Chicago. So tonight I wanna to use this as sort of a, a way to think about that local national um, relationship. So the activism in The Great Believers is sort of a, a, a dramatic backdrop uh, because the story, as you know, if you've read the novel, focuses around a group of friends who are impacted by HIV and AIDS. And um, as I think with lots of literature, it humanizes those experiences and those struggles. But like the history of that iconic bloody handprint that I just showed you, the history of AIDS activism requires that we really focus on nuance and context, that time and place really matter. This is the voice of my historian training speaking. And uh, that history suggests that grassroots activism, which is exemplified by ACT UP, that was organized, strategic, creative, really helped to shape the course of that epidemic in the United States and eventually the world uh, in pandemic terms. Uh, so today what I'd like to do is take a little closer look at an important ACT UP demonstration or a series of actions that happened in Chicago in 1990 that uh, Rebecca Mackay actually refers to in the book, The Great Believers. And this will be a good example, I think, of some of the things that I'm talking about. So it's important to kind of think about the context here. In Chicago, uh, where this protest and series of protests happens in 1990. Um, there's a lot of change that has happened around public health in particular. So in the 1970s, as we know here in California, of course, there was an enormous tax revolt and um, this happened in other parts of the country. And by the 1980s, uh, there's significant cuts in federal funding with the Reagan administration and disinvestment in public services. This led to a lot of financial stress in the access and delivery of healthcare in particular, and um, the federal response to AIDS around the conservative ascendancy of the Reagan administration. The city itself was highly segregated along race and class lines, um, including the LGBT community, which, have, which had sort of a pocket around the north, on the north side, predominantly white, um, 
but HIV and AIDS, of course, had spread spread around the city. And that, that sort of segregation along those lines really had a, an important role in shaping the course of this epidemic in this one location as elsewhere. The other thing I think to think about here too is that the creation of an urban multiracial coalition in the city of Chicago beginning in the 70s and 80s um, and the emergent, the emergent political block of the LGBT community in the city, um, as well as the persistence of race and class divisions. So this kind of climate uh, into which HIV and AIDS emerges is important to shape some of the things that happen next. So a couple things just um, before we talk about this 1990 action. Uh, in the period, at least up into 2000, between 1980 and 2000, um, in Chicago, there were about 40,000 people who had been diagnosed with HIV and AIDS and about 15,000 deaths in this one city. The first AIDS clinic opens in Crook County Hospital, which is documented in the novel, um, the only public history, the only public hospital in the city. Um, and by the time you get to the end, towards the end of the 1980s, most of the patients in that hospital are gay men of color, 70% or so, um, and often uninsured. Um, as a public hospital, it accepted all kinds of folks um, in the wards. And the people who were living with AIDS, because it was a very financially difficult disease to live with, uh, were primarily living on Social Security and public assistance if they ended up in that Cook County Hospital setting. By the late 1980s, there's a lot of um, national pressure emerging around this. Uh, ACT UP, as we're going to talk about in a second, is founded in the late 1980s, um, in part because of the increasing urgency of this crisis around the country, particularly in urban spaces. And even though the federal government is starting to respond by the late 80s, um, there, because of the conservative politics of the period, um, there's often a lot of homophobia beneath some of those policies. So I think a good example is the Helms Amendment to a funding bill where AIDS funding could only be used for testing and not prevention in the same way um, that other health um, funding was uh, being developed. So it's resulted in the sort of lack of focus in terms of where the, the resources really needed to go. So in Chicago or in Illinois, before 18, 1989, most activists were targeting the state level, not the city. And that's because there were a series of draconian laws in a more conservative state, Chicago being a more liberal space in a more conservative state, a series of draconian laws, things like mandatory HIV testing, which had come in in the mid eighties, um, calls for an AIDS registry, a contact tracing system to tr track people you would have come in contact with, um, and then keeping that as a database, all these privacy concerns around that with um, LGBT folks and folks who were um, uh, infected with HIV. And by the time you get to the late 1980s, ACT UP, which is uh, becoming, becoming more national as we get into the late 80s, um, targeting insurance companies, the FDA and other organizations to try to get access to research and appropriate drugs. So this is all important to kind of think about this context. So the action in Chicago in April of 1990, which is figures prominently at the end of this novel, was actually part of a national campaign that ACT UP waged called National AIDS Action for Healthcare. And this was a series of actions around the country, Chicago being one of them. And ACT UP Chicago, which had emerged from a series of organizations that started in 87 with Dagmar, Dykes and Gay Men Against Repression, Reagan, the right wing, um, eventually becoming Act Up Chicago. Uh, we're organizing this at the local level. So like the poster campaign in New York City, uh, this action in Chicago or series of events was pretty prominently organized by the folks in Chicago, even though nationally it drew a lot of activists. Chicago was targeted in part because it was the national headquarters of the American Medical Association and there were insurance companies like Prudential that had prominent uh, corporate headquarters in Chicago. So this was strategically um, targeted by ACT UP. 
Um, the event, there are many events, including a teach-in, uh, a vigil for participants, I mean, a vigil in front of the Cook County Hospital, and a variety of other things I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the march, the centerpiece of the action was on Saturday, April 23rd. Between 1,000 and 3,000 people attended, 250 police officers and many on horseback. They targeted the insurance company, Prudential, the Cook County building, which is in Chicago, and, um, and the Cook County Hospital, so all these spaces. And at the end of the day, 129 people were arrested. It's important to think about the timing of this. 1990, this is a, a chart from the CDC that shows the estimated AIDS diagnosis deaths in the United States between 81 and 2008. And if you'll notice, you can see the screen. Uh, 1990 is a trajectory where many people are dying. Infections are increasing. And um, there's not a lot of hope yet in the, in the period for effective treatments. So there's a lot of anger, frustration in 1990. So the date is pretty significant around why this national action happens. Now, to give you sort of a flavor of what this event is like, or was like, uh, I'm going to show a clip from a film or a television program that was produced in 1990 by something called the Gay Cable Network. This was out of New York City. But they covered a lot of protests around the country, including the, the Chicago protests. So we're going to watch a little bit of this. And um, I'd like you to kind of listen to what the participants are saying, some of the images um, that, that, that you're going to see on the screen. Uh, we're going to dive a little deep, deeper into in just a sec. We're in Chicago, Illinois, where a huge ACT UP demonstration has gathered around 1,200 people here in front of the American Medical Association headquarters. Estimated people with AIDS population in Chicago right now is around 3,000. The HIV positive population of Cook County is estimated at 30 to 50,000. So we think that any ward with 15 beds would be sadly inadequate. Even if the other 15 beds were opened, it would be sadly inadequate because the county has never come up with any kind of strategic vision of how to deal with the epidemic. It's 11 years into the epidemic, and the city of Chicago Department of Health has just now come up with a strategic plan for dealing with AIDS. The demonstration began at Prudential Plaza at approximately 8 a.m. Monday morning. Keep in mind, you can see what the posture of the police is. We want people who decide to do that to do it in an educated It was when ACT UP took to the streets that the police became excessively violent in shoving matches and used mounted police to physically intimidate and injure at least two demonstrators. We had a medical emergency and I had to leave and I just got back. This is... of this demonstration was uh, to bring to light um, the problems of the public health care system of which a lot of people, okay, of which a lot of people with AIDS depend on now, especially with the redlining going on in the insurance, insurance industry. And while we, why we are here in front of the Cook County Board Building in Chicago is because they control the purse strings. They're the reason why things aren't getting done, not just about AIDS care, but care for everybody in the city. Why we have no coordination between the city clinics, the county clinics, and the state-funded clinics. They're the reason why. That's why we're here. And also because we don't want to tear up Cook County. Cook County is all we have. We don't want to tear up this building either. But if something was to get broken at Cook County, it would stay broken. There are light bulbs that haven't been fixed in Cook County for two months. There's no computerized 
record keeping system there. So that's one of the goals, that's the, the main goals of this demonstration. We want to call for national health care. We want to let the American people know that what's going on out here and we want to let the powers that be know that the American people really do want a national health care plan. We want some kind of nationalized plan. We really don't want a two-tiered health care system. We don't want a public system and then a private system because the all public system is going to always get screwed over. This was the scene one block from the Cook County Medical Administration's building where the Women's Coalition symbolically set up an AIDS ward with 15 mattresses. Once again, horses were used to intimidate and injure. You're putting people in danger. Get your horse out of here. We are people that are living with AIDS. We are here to demand health care, and all you can do is send your horse out. We already one person has been injured being kicked by a horse. A woman has been injured. It appears that about 10 people have been injured, some through... So I don't know what happened, but I'm going to start that chair again. Okay, I think we're back. So that um, those images uh, really give a sense of the sort of urgency of what ACT UP is trying to do in 1990 here in Chicago. But let's dig in a little bit to some of the specifics. Um, and I think it illustrates a bit about how, while the novel really gets us sort of understanding a bit about the role of these protests in the history of these friends and um, the great believers. But the um, details really matter for historians. So here's an example. Um, the ACT UP Chicago uh, Women's Caucus actually organized the event around mattresses that were placed in front of the hospital to protest that women weren't being admitted to the ward. And so they created this protest to both um, illustrate that point, but also in the spirit of ACT UP to raise awareness around this generally general issue around how women's experience of HIV and AIDS were very different than men, and to try to uh, raise the consciousness that this was not something on the, on the radar of healthcare professionals. So this is a photo from that, um, that protest. So here's from the novel. Yale had Xeroxed uh, a route map followed, um, folded in his pocket, a huge loop that looked like too much walking. The American Medical Association was the next big stop, followed by another insurance place and finally back to Daly Plaza, where they'd plant themselves in front of the Cook County building to protest the closure of half the AIDS beds at Cook County Hospital the fact that the word wouldn't take women. And then a little bit later, um, you heard right. No, Yale hadn't. Cook County Hospital is now officially, drumroll please, treating female AIDS patients. Seriously, that fast? Like because of the protest? You didn't think it would work, did you? Listen, Yale, I'm not making this up. This shit works. I want to stay involved. And that's Asher speaking in the novel. What's I think important here to recognize is that in that, uh, in the characters, yes, they're discussing this protest in front of the hospital, but it's in some ways erasing the spirit of that particular part of the action that was organized by women. You don't get a sense of that in the novel. And uh, what's important, I think, is to really see why the, what is happening, how they're organizing, and what they're trying to say. So here's uh, a couple examples. These are folks that participated in that, um, in that action. So Sandra Johnson, who you saw in the film, um, was interviewed here in 2020. And Mary Patton, uh, 
uh, are two, and their photographs are here in the upper right hand corner. They were two ACT UP Chicago members who organized that mattress protest. And so one thing I think that they really illustrate here is that they really focus on how the action can shine the light on an inequity. In this case, how women are not being treated in the hospital and um, the issues around women's health are not being um, taken seriously by the medical establishment at the time. And so they created what they called an AIDS ward in the street, as Mary Patton says here in 2020. The idea is that they would set the mattresses out on the street and they would create a space uh, that sort of symbolically would be, here's what the AIDS ward is because they don't allow us into the building. And one of the things that you learn from this, these recollections is that the importance of this protest, uh, the importance of this part of the action um, for the protest as a whole. So Sandra Johnson says, the women's action with the mattresses was one of the last things to happen on that multi-day um, action because we wanted to spotlight on them, knowing that the media attention would be very strong. And um, one of the things to think about, I think, with this uh, kind of protest is that it really demonstrates the creativity that ACT UP brought to, this, to the story or, or to the story of this history of um, AIDS activism. And it became a space for them to engage that creativity in a very self-conscious political way. So as um, Debbie Gould, who was also involved in this and her photographs here on the upper right-hand corner, uh, says it this way, that engage, engaged in world-making with like-minded people, we felt exuberant, joyous, engaged, connected to one another, sexy and consequential. I think this is important because for folks that were feeling very disempowered by the situation, so many deaths, so many challenges, that this, these kinds of actions gave folks the kind of hope that they needed, that they could participate and make a difference, that they feel connected to each other and that their work mattered. And in terms of organizing, this is an important part of what ACT UP brought to the history of this period, that folks who had been portrayed in the media as victims took that back and used and asserted themselves as powerful people, even as people with AIDS. And the Chicago protester illustrates that really well. And particularly for women who were being left out of a lot of the narrative at the time, um, this is an important part of this. Uh, another participant, um, Jeannie um, Crocker, Jean Crocker, was also involved in the ACT UP, one of the founders of ACT UP uh, Chicago, um, and involved in that action. And here she describes a little bit about how the, the action emerged. So they had a separate meeting to plan the event. Uh, they felt they could do something with mattresses that kind of came up from the creative um, engagement of the participants. They put them in alleys around the loop and then dragged them into the, the loop as a, around uh, downtown Chicago, the subway that goes around downtown Chicago. And they uh, brought them out in front of the hospital. And she describes it this way. They had slogans on them, like AIDS is a disaster, women die faster. So they became props. And if the police thought anything, they thought, this is idiocy. They're lugging these mattresses. So picturing these mattresses used as ways to communicate a message, not only in their placement, but also uh, writing on those mattresses. Um, and uh, Crocker kind of reflect, reflected upon this in 20, uh, 2010 on her involvement in uh, ACT UP. And the important thing I think to think about here is that up until the late 1970s, the 1970s, lesbian and, and gay men were really operating in many separate worlds and AIDS brought them to back together after years of separation. But it also brought in a lot of other activists um, who were worried about healthcare access, inequities, all those things. And they had been involved in, in these coalitions um, with, with ACT UP as an example. And um, she remembered it this way, when people started becoming HIV positive and dying, we decided we had to take a stronger stand politically as queers or gay people. So it became a, uh, an opportunity for empowerment. So again, the narrative here of 
victim to empowered person um, in the context of this epidemic. Another example, I think, from the novel that is uh, that really resonated with me too was the use of chants that were very significant as part of ACT UPS and other uh, protest work of the period. And I just want to point out here, this is a photo from this demonstration. Notice this, the poster that we started this presentation with here showing up in Chicago in 1990, so many years after, or years after it's created. So here's again from the novel. Yale and, F and Fiona joined the chant, um, healthcare, healthcare is a right. Whatever momentum he'd lost from the detour to the hotel, he easily picked up again. When was the last time he yelled? He yelled at Cubs games. He yelled at Charlie when they were breaking up, but he hadn't yelled about AIDS. Uh, he hadn't yelled at the government. He hadn't yelled at the forces that denied Katsu to Tommy, one of his friends, health insurance. At the county hospital system that had made Katsu visit or wait two weeks for a bed when he couldn't breathe and then let him die in a ward that smelled like piss. He hadn't yelled at this new mayor at his lip service, he hadn't yelled at the universe. And some of the chants that um, Makai uses in the novel, they say, get back, we say, fight back. Uh, people with AIDS under attack, what do we do? Act up, fight back. So this question of the chants as sort of a form of empowerment is an important part to recognize around ACT UP and their strategy. Um, a little bit more on those. If you attended a demo like this, you might have gotten a sheet, a chant sheet, like something like this. This is an example from a later protest, but one that is pretty typical of the period where you would show up, someone could give you these, these chants, and so everyone would sort of have this resource um, at their disposal, keep it in your back pocket, use it as a way to uh, create a collective voice. And the role of chants in a protest like this, this uh, action in Chicago in 1990 was pretty significant. Noise, volume, um, as the video clip suggests too, those, uh, that's an important part of this whole uh, milieu that ACT UP is trying to create. So here's a couple examples. Steve Mogalski, who attended that protest, says it this way. I'm thinking, are we just gonna walk and chant things? I asked someone near me and they said, no, we're gonna to try to get inside a building. We're gonna lie down in the street. And I thought, oh my God, what have I signed up for? Lori Cannon reflected again around this protest. You're hearing the voices, the drums, the chanting. There were tambourines, there were wood blocks. And you can get a sense of this, the importance of noise and chanting and volume from the video clip that we saw as a way to make yourself present and known and you cannot ignore. Steve ref reflects again, people were chanting, the whole world is watching, an old 1960s uh, chant, the whole world is watching. And I had chills up my spine and I felt like, my God, I am part of something. So this idea that chanting, having a demo chant sheet, participating with noise, with a drum, became, you became part of a collective. This was collective action, collective noise making, collective chanting and you were, it was bigger than you. And so it became an important part of the way to bring people in to the protest itself. So a couple things before we sort of open it up for some discussion. Jennifer Breyer has written one of, probably one of the definitive books on the history, the political response to AIDS in the United States, Infectious Ideas, uh, reflected on ACT UP um, this way. Over the course of the group's first four years of existence, ACT UP was wildly, wildly successful. Members, for example, fought the state and the pharmaceutical industry to transform the development process for drugs, changed the clinical definition of AIDS so that more women were included, oversaw the expansion of independent housing for people with AIDS, and generally made, made AIDS crisis visible through, the con through conscious and consistent manipulation. So this idea that the impact of this protest is just one of many things that ACT UP around the country did, and they were very localized in terms of their, um, their areas of focus. Some were nationally uh, 
oriented, like the most of the protests in Washington, D.C. at the NIH and places like uh, the FDA. Those uh, brought activists from all over the country. Some of them were very local, like in New York City or Philadelphia or Chicago or in Los Angeles. Um, and I think what this action in Chicago tells us is that it was organized with a strategic focus. It wasn't just about let's march and complain. It was about access to healthcare, funding, and calling attention to the inequities in the healthcare system. That this was very conscious about the targeted locations where they stopped, the chants that they used, the signs that they produced, um, the media that they produced about the event. This was all very um, strategically thought through. It also demonstrates, I think, uh, of ACT UP's use of creative engagement. You know, using art, music, um, theater, street theater, all kinds of uh, creative um, forms to kind of engage these questions politically. And the participation was meaningful for people, as I think some of the recollections of its participants uh, reflect. It also demonstrates a really creative use of media, creating media moments and creating your own narrative using these different forms of media to get the word out about HIV and AIDS, but also on your own terms. We're not victims, we're powerful people. It also suggests that real consciousness about challenging sites of power in order to affect social change. So the example of the uh, Women's Caucus mattress demonstration in front of the hospital, just a few days later, as the quote from the novel suggests, they, accept, uh, they created um, infrastructure to accept women into the ward. So there was, a, uh, there was an effort to really focus on where can we make a difference? Who needs to listen to this message? And particularly focusing on sites of power is the way to do that. And finally, I think it's a great example of how grassroots organizing like ACT UP had an impact on the AIDS epidemic. The trajectory of this epidemic really changed because of this work. And uh, Jennifer Breyer talks about how some of that played out in changing clinical definitions, getting access to uh, additional funds for research and uh, creating better li living conditions for people with AIDS. So this grassroots effort really did um, produce change. So I'll just close before we have a chance for some discussion with a reflection by Lori Lightfoot, who was uh, currently the mayor of Chicago and opened the first openly lesbian mayor of the city of Chicago. And here she's reflecting on the importance of this activism from the 1980s and 90s on the moment we're living through today with the current pandemic. She said this in an interview, in an article, in an interview in the Chicago Sun-Times. Too many government actors were ignoring this horrible pandemic, meaning the AIDS pandemic, that was sweeping through, not just gay and lesbian communities across the country and across the world. It was affecting lots of other folks. Then come to this moment, where we're facing another pandemic of global proportions. Put aside the federal government, but at least at the state and the local level, where we have all been all in on the front lines, the difference is profound. The difference really is because of those early AIDS activists who were out in the streets. A lot of the things that we have done in our public health response is attributable to the focus and the dedication of those early pioneers who were demanding that the scourge that was robbing people of their lives at such a young age had to be acknowledged, there, that there had to be a fulsome government response. So thanks for your time. I would uh, love to hear questions, comments, things that you'd like to talk about. I think you use the Q&A feature. So I'm gonna turn off the my screen. I welcome any So we have a couple of comments um, in the Q&A. 
comment along how segregation along race and class lines continues, and it's clearly evident in the, cur the current pandemic. Um, I think what's interesting about the Chicago example, um, as Stuart, uh, Timothy Stewart Winter, who wrote a wonderful book about the Chicago LGBTQ political community, um, makes an argument that this, pan this epidemic, the AIDS epidemic in Chicago, only exacerbated existing inequalities. And it's really reminded me of the kind of moment we're in right now, where the coronavirus pandemic is really highlighting the inequalities we're currently experiencing in the United States and the world. Uh, so just for example, who's getting vaccinated right now, uh, where, um, where are most of the infections happening, who, who's able to, to work at home. These are all questions that really exa have exacerbated the inequalities of the time we're living in. And it was very similar in Chicago in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s. So for example, the um, African-American community in Chicago on the South side didn't have the same resources as the folks on the North side. And so the response, for example, in um, nonprofits that were kind of working in HIV and AIDS and for lack of federal response, um, weren't able to reach those communities as much. So there were these disparities even in the nonprofit world that was trying to address these, uh, this epidemic in Chicago. Let's see if there's another, another question. Um, is ACT UP still going? Yes, ACT UP is still around, but it's changed dramatically since, since the um, 1980s. Um, but the, it is still around. Uh, the question around how ACT UP changes in it is an interesting one. Um, ACT UP in its early history uh, was very much a, a coalition. That, that was its uh, framework. So you could come to ACT UP from many different kinds of communities and if you found an, a segment of the community that you would uh, want to work on or an issue you'd want to work on, you'd find a collective of people and you could work on that. It wasn't really a centrally controlled kind of agenda. It was one that really responded to local conditions and responded to issues that groups of people within the coalition wanted to, to work on. Um, so as a model for organizing, you know, it really uh, could respond really quickly to things on the ground. And that was really the urgency of the period, the idea that you know, this is something we need to respond to actively and urgently to what's happening in, in our communities. And that required a nimble response. And ACT UP was sort of organized on that, uh, sort of on that model. Um, let's see if there's some other questions here. Were there any disinformation campaigns circulating around HIV and AIDS? Um, well, that's an interesting question because one of the reasons why a group like ACT UP uh, created their own media was in fact to counter those disinformation campaigns. And one of the examples from this particular protest that we talked about today uh, was the use of gloves. So for example, police officers wearing gloves when they're arresting people on the street. And some of the chants were around the, the wearing of gloves. You know, your gloves don't match your shoes. Take them you know, in terms of taunting the police, this idea that they would be infected by touching a person with AIDS. And so this kind of using the demonstration as a way to counter that disinformation around um, transmission of HIV. And, um, but there's plenty of disinformation on the mainstream, in the mainstream media as well. So uh, ACT UP and other organizations created their own uh, television programs, uh, newsletters, magazines, all kinds of other uh, alter alternative ways to get the message out. Um, ACT UP, um, for example, had a very active art campaign. So those posters, uh, which would provide information, but also be eye-catching, would kind of um, correct misinformation. So a poster with two people um, kissing, kissing doesn't kill. That would be an example of trying to 
counter that misinformation. So let's see. Here's a question. Um, do you, as a historian, think the author did a good job of representing this period in the gay community in Chicago? That's a really good question. And I think about that a lot as a historian because I, I do use fiction sometimes in my teaching, but I have a preference for fiction written in the period that we're studying as opposed to fiction that's written about something in the past. And here's why. Um, I think that the objective of historians and novelists are very different. So while I appreciate in this book, uh, in The Great Believers, the attention to the detail around the, the personal, sort of the personal history of people who are struggling with HIV and AIDS in this period and then later on in life and uh, as, as the book toggles between the 80s and 90s and 2015, um, I appreciate that sort of human dimension that literature can provide. Uh, but I think as my presentation suggests, you can only go so far in really digging into the sort of deeper histories that are a little more complicated and maybe hard to represent. Uh, so I think on a on whole, she does a pretty good job. Uh, I got a feel for the period. And I think as a novelist, that's probably one of the things that she would want us as readers to do to get a real feel for the impact of on these communities. Uh, but as a historian, I'd want to dig more. And I'm hoping this talk um, gives you an example of what I would do to kind of dig a little bit more into that. Um, let's see. Was, how was the police response similar to or different from the response to protests and or insurrections happening at this time? Um, interesting question. So I think the, the question, how, how, how to respond to that I think is a little difficult. Um, in the 1980s and 90s, the, you know, of course it's coming out of protests from the 60s uh, and, and law enforcement had been pretty rough on some of these protesters. And particularly in the early 80s, uh, the early AIDS epidemic, uh, ACT UP focused a lot on police brutality in terms of their protests and their, their response to some of their actions. Um, but of course, in a lot of ACT UP chapters, there were a lot of white folks, it wasn't exclusively white, but there were a lot of white folks. Um, some of them were uh, wealthier, some of them had more resources. They had access to lawyers so that they could um, perhaps challenge the system a little bit more than more vulnerable communities. And in, in fact, that was maybe some of their strength that they could step out where others couldn't. Um, but at the same time, as I think the Chicago demo illustrates, the police action were still pretty strong, a lot of their actions, but not, nothing like we saw this past summer. So I think we have to, we have to conclude in some ways that um, the racial dimensions of this really shaped the way policing happened. And I'm, I'm not an expert on policing in the 21st century, so I wouldn't want to speak to it too much other than what I know as a person uh, who tries to read about it. But I think there are differences and you can kind of see it. But a good question. Um, do you feel like history repeats itself more than it should, especially around epidemics and pandemics? That's a good question. So, um, watching the time, I think this this might uh, we might have one more question after this. The uh, I don't actually think history repeats itself, but I think we can learn from history about how to respond to new situations. It gives us a, a, a sense of nuance. So for example, Laurie Lightfoot's comment at the end of my presentation about um, what ACT UP's impact is today in terms of how we're responding to this epidemic and pandemic. I think that's uh, true to some extent in, in the sense that we learned a lot from the AIDS crisis, AIDS pandemic 
about how to respond to a major public health crisis, but it doesn't seem to have made a complete difference in terms of the effectiveness of that response. So at the local level, as she says, we learned from that epidemic, that pandemic, and we've applied those principles in public health to what we're doing today. Absolutely true to some degree. But the populations are very different. So in the 80s and 90s, when you have marginalized communities, um, gay folks, HIV, um, IV drug users, uh, folks who are, are more poor, who don't have access to health care or the education campaigns around HIV transmission, um, the, the federal response, government response required like organizations like ACT UP, ACT UP to press those boundaries to say, hey, you're not paying attention to this, pen, to this epidemic. Whereas today, uh, the protests are very different around this. I was just talking about this. Um, the protests are very different around the current pandemic um, in terms of I don't want to wear a mask or uh, I don't want the government to tell me how to respond to this crisis. So there's the populations are very different. The situation is very different. Maybe the public health response has learned something, but I'm not so sure about the other. Um, but that's a, something I, I definitely want to work to think about. So I think one more question, and then uh, I think we have to close pretty soon. Were there any specific events that finally got the attention of the government and forced them to take action? Well, the example tonight uh, around Cook County Hospital, um, that action did result in changes to policies within the hospital. So at the local level, these protests could be effective. Um, the protests uh, that act up uh, waged against the FDA and the NIH uh, a little bit later, or a little bit earlier than this, this one in 1990, um, did result in some change in terms of how uh, research was conducted and how to make drugs more available to um, folks who were living with AIDS. Um, and it created this whole idea that people who are living with AIDS are experts in their own, in understanding their own disease. This idea of we, we should be at the table. We should be part of the solution to this situation, not just passive actors or passive um, recipients of the information that the experts provide. And so they, they did change those dynamics um, in terms of um, HIV and AIDS research and treatment. And so they, uh, I think that is a significant um, difference in terms of how they, how they made change. Now, whether that happens with one significant event, I'm not so sure. I think isolated examples, yes, but it's over the course of time. Um, they, their, their heyday really is um, up until the mid nineties before protease in, in, inhibitors come into play the drug cocktails that become treatments, um, then it becomes a whole other set of questions around who, who can afford that, what kind of access do people have um, to those treatments? Um, and so it, it does change. But I think um, in terms of the impact, they really did have an impact. So I think that's, uh, we're at 554. So I'm gonna turn it back over to I'm not sure, Denise or Sarah, but um, thanks very much for your questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. Hi, thank you so much, David. That was a fascinating examination of the history of activism and what a powerful source it, 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 it uh, sorry, powerful force it was. Um, thank you also to the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, especially to Sarah Jones, the person behind the scenes who's making this presentation come off without a hitch. Um, I'd like to also say that Our Community Reads is a program that brings you speakers like David. And we also give away dozens of books to our high schools, to the presenters for the program, and to our library system.
um, in our in-person events, which we hope to return to next year, are quite costly to produce. So we hope that you'll consider donating to our program. I think you'll see a link there on your screen. So again, thank you all for coming and we hope to see you next time. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.